to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, uh, depending on what part of the world you are. Um, my name is Ayo Ayodele. I'm a private wealth advisor with Alliance Bernstein. And joining me today is my colleague, Heather George. Um, and we are here to speak about family engagement. Um, you know, I work again as a, as, a, as a private wealth advisor. I primarily advise global families, cross-border families, um, international families. And Heather is, you know, is our, our co-head of our family engagement services. And we're very delighted um, to speak to, to the audience today. Um, the title of our discussion is how family engagement can lead to successful to, can lead to better succession planning outcomes uh, for, you know, for families. And, and with that, um, we're going to walk you through, you know, the agenda. Um, we'll spend some time just introducing you to our firm, uh, Bernstein Private Wealth Management. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, our capabilities working with international global families and business owners, which is this audience. And then Heather will sort of dive deeper into, you know, our family engagement service capabilities and then we'll then go through some Q and A's um, based on questions that we continuously encounter um, from from families um, and also international um, uh, um, partners. And then we'll then maybe take some a few questions uh, at the end, uh, depending on how we do with time. Okay, so Bernstein, um, I'll spend some time introducing you to to our firm. Uh, um, Bernstein Private Wealth Management. We are part of the Alliance of Bernstein, a global asset management firm. You know, we manage $686 billion the last time we checked um, globally. Um, and we've been in business for over 50 years. Um, we are purely an asset management firm, meaning, you know, we don't have any sort of uh, conflicts, you know, with a banking or proprietary trading type of operation. All we primarily do is, is investment management. Now, um, you know, we've been doing this again for over 50 years. Our private wealth management business, which is where Heather and I sit, uh, manages about $100 billion, um, of which, again, you know, we have a significant um, set of international clients um, looking at managing the assets from a cross-border perspective. We are in 51 cities in 25 different countries. Um, you know, we have, again, as I mentioned earlier, purely asset management uh, business. But we also have a, a research, um, very strong research platform. We're actually one of the leading sell side research analyst businesses on the street. And we have over 287 um, research analysts. 100% of our revenues come from asset management. And we have no long term debt um, because we're purely, purely money management focused. So I guess the next question you'll probably be asking is how we invest. Um, you know, so we, we work on the premise knowing that great financial success typically results in complexity. And it's our job to help our clients um, navigate through this complexity. And how do we do that? We do that through our portfolio construction approach. Okay, most of our clients are investing on a very long-term basis. And we, we, we understand that investing on a long-term basis differs from client to client. And because of that, the objective, of the underlying objective of the client is what really determines how they're allocated. Taking this into consideration, we work with clients to either risk mitigate based on if they're, if they're looking to risk mitigate um, a, a portfolio, return seeking, if they're looking to, 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 to generate returns from the portfolio, or diversifying you know, where they're looking to create opportunities and take advantage of market dislocations. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see um, sort of a hypothetical example here where you know, a conservative allocation in the middle, the middle chart right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this particular portfolio is constructed for a client that has, you know, a conservative allocation for core capital. So you see about a 62% risk mitigating uh, um, allocation, 27% to return seeking, and about 11% for diversifying. This particular client is more focused on a lifetime, lifestyle spending approach. Um, on the right, it's a little bit um, more focused on, on legacy goals, right? So... This client is allocating more to what return seeking because they're planning on the long term for legacy for legacy goal to be uh, to be accomplished right in in the role asset management. Um, as far as the array of options that are tailored for our clients, as we consider how to asset allocate, we have.
quite a number of bear strategies, right? So we have a passive strategy. We can, we can basically employ passive strategies, balanced multi-factor strategies, purpose-driven strategies, which is sort of tied to ESG, um, environmental social governance, low volatility strategies for those clients that are looking at um, basically experiencing less risk and, and, and less volatility, the yield focus strategies for those types of clients that are looking for perhaps, you know, more of sort of a, a um, fixed um, and risk mitigated approach to investing their, and their assets. And that's more on the stock stock side of things. On the bond side of things, this is what clients are looking for a fixed income um, approach to allocating their assets, right? These types of strategies that we will employ include sort of a core intermediate duration, stability, inflation linked, um, income, and other passive types of strategies. And then on, on the alternative side, you know, we have quite a number of different strategies that range from private credit, private equity, alternative credit, hedge funds, um, direct real estate, uh, option strategies, and other co-investment um, strategies as well. Now, um, speaking on our portfolio construction um, approach, one of the things that we are very deliberate about and the way in which Bernstein actually is very unique in the industry is that we have an integrated approach to working with our clients and constructing their portfolios. Okay. Compared to the cut, you know, the average industry standard, which is basically focused on suitability where most asset managers are looking to distribute, um, you know, on, on the basis of trying to chase performance, looking for best in class performance, hiring and firing managers, without sort of monitoring tax and monitoring tax and risks in a way that is conducive and aligned with the overall objective of the client, we take a more integrated approach. As I mentioned earlier, we are purely focused on asset management. That is all that we do. And because of that, it enables us to work in an integrated fashion, okay, allowing us to focus on what's, what's really um, important to, you know, to the overall client's uh, objective and we, are, and we do that um, by focusing on customized solutions for our clients. You know, we have a very flexible platform. Our portfolio managers communicate with one another. We're not chasing performance and hiring and firing managers because, you know, everyone is working under the Bernstein platform. And what does that do? It engineers and designs a customized approach for our clients, which ultimately best positions them for success. Global families. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are a global firm and we understand that global families, international families, including the audience here today, have very unique and distinct needs. OK, these needs are they cut across, you know, the fact that they have mixed uh, citizenships. They're dealing with in international barriers, international borders, offshore needs, you know, um, tax situations, you know, integrate, integrate trade-offs and disjointed offerings. Okay, these are some of the unique challenges that global families face. And at Bernstein, we are really deliberate about working on, a, basically putting together an approach that is actually tailored um, to satisfy these specific needs for, for our international families. These are some of the questions that we basically get from clients um, on, a, on a sort of an ongoing basis. And, and as we think about our global family's um, hat, um, how do we simplify the complex planning challenges? When do you choose between onshore and offshore structures? How do you invest seamlessly between jurisdictions? How do you alloc asset allocate in a tax sensitive manner? What is the single point of contact for advice? Um, how do you adapt to changing circumstances? And how do you find experts that will collaborate with, you know, with other, with other advisors or, you know, other family offices in a multifamily, um, in a multifamily office type of structure? These are the types of issues that we continuously run into. And our platform is purposely set up to actually address these issues on behalf of our international families. Um, how do we do this? And what, what can Bernstein uniquely apply? We do this by sort of thinking through what are the analysis and planning expertise required for insights to provide some of the some of the solutions to these challenges that I'd um, um, previously illustrated? Um, how do you quantify the trade-offs for offshore versus onshore structures? For example, pre-immigration planning, um, or U.S. beneficiaries of a foreign uh, foreign uh, foreign trust, or transferring wealth from 
from you know from one jurisdiction to a U.S. well um, tax pay, uh, paying um, um, structure, or even looking at all the U.S. citizens living abroad. You know, how do they compose their portfolios in a way that is going to complement a tax approach to um, achieving their sort of long term objectives? Those are some of the insights we provide. And from a solution solution set perspective, as I mentioned earlier, because of the integrated model that we have at Bernstein where, you know, um, we are all working together, you know, the various portfolio managers, the advisors, and research. We are able to customize a solution that would put our global family clients, um, position them for success as they continue to, to consider these onshore or offshore um, challenges that they, they, they may run into from time to time. Um, business owner. So business owner segment is sorry business owner segment have similar to global families very distinct needs and some of the things that you know they are really thinking about on a day-to-day basis you know run you know cut across from how do they stay afloat for catering to their to their employees how do they build the best team how do they access capital um you know what are the best insights trends and what sort of the thought not um thought leadership that's leading in their respective industries how do they maximize on a potential deal in the event they're looking to sell? And how do they replace income um, after sale or a, a succession plan? And to help them address um, some of these issues, you know, we, again, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have the insight um, and analysis and planning framework to be able to help them to do this. And some of the types of issues that we actually look to address include, so for in the, in the case of what level of financial assets do, do, does a business owner need to support its, uh, its lifestyle. You know, we will actually run, um, you know, wealth forecasting analysis where we're actually projecting, you know, what would be the future, uh, what, what are the future scenarios, right, based on where the ex- prevailing existing market conditions are today and how should they tailor their assets or tailor their investment strategy to be able to take advantage of dislocations in the market and position them to be successful. What deal structure should they evaluate, right? So working with our wealth strategies, wealth strategists um, like, like Heather, um, you know, how do they position themselves um, to evaluate specific deal structures and put together um, efficient planning frameworks to be able to allow their families to actually have businesses that are, remain going concerns, whether or not they decide to do a deal to sell or not. Um, and then from a solutions, solution set standpoint, we have various ways in which we actually consider and look at, um, you know, addressing some of these issues that, that our business owner clients face. And these range from, you know, qualified small business stock, selling and hedging strategies, cash management, tax mitigation, charitable giving, and family wealth transfer. Um, you know, I'll now like to pass the mic to my colleague, Heather George, um, to talk uh, more about how we use the family engagement lens to be able to address the needs of our, our business and global family clients. Heather? Ayo, thank you so much. Uh, that was a good introduction. Um, you know, Ayo really covered a lot of our expertise around tax, around legal, and around investing, which is just so critical. It's the heart of what we do for our clients. But I serve in a different capacity at Bernstein, slightly different. I think about our clients and their success more holistically, more broadly. And in particular, I think about their wealth their, and their, in combination with their families. And what could our clients as families be doing together to make sure that they truly achieve the long-term, multi-generational success that they're hoping for, right? So at Bernstein, the service area that supports our clients on the non-financial aspects of, of their family wealth journey live in what we call family engagement. Next slide, Io. Thanks for driving the slides for me today. Yeah, no worries. And I created the display on the left-hand side of this page to get the heart of kind of reminding our clients what's important. So often, 
um, business owners, families, people who've had um, financial success, they focus on the business, they focus on the wealth, they focus on the assets, they focus on the top bubble of the left hand display, right? How do I pass on our assets to our kids, to our grandkids, maybe someday to our great great grandkids? How do we preserve and grow our financial success, right? Our financial assets. And I remind clients that just as important as passing on the assets or the wealth is having the right family culture and passing on your value system, what's important to you, as well as arming and preparing not only the next generation, but future generations with the knowledge that they need to be successful in the context of your family and your family wealth journey, right? So the advice and the support that I provide to clients intersects with the wealth, but it's strongly focused on the bottom half of this display. I'm getting clients to shift the conversation to think more intentionally about their family culture, their values, and what knowledge the next generation and future generations need to pass on. Next slide, please. And why do clients do this work? Why do they engage in these conversations and these family meetings and these discussions, right? What is the point of it, so to speak? Well, the point of it is on this page. Like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get families to, to really define their family culture. Everybody has a family culture, but it's usually not top of mind for the clients that we work with. They may have a very well-defined um business culture for example let's say they're a business owning family they have a pretty strong sense for what is the business culture and where they want to maintain and grow that culture and improve it over time i'm trying to get families to say look whether you realize it or not your family has a culture and you need to make sure that the culture of your family is aligned with the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve right if you want true multi-generational success, you want your great-great-grandkids to benefit and preserve and grow the assets and continue this family successful wealth journey, then you need the right family culture to support those outcomes. And that includes really thinking intentionally and critically about family communication. Are you talking about the right things? Are you talking at all, right? That's a whole nother question, Io, that we get into with families, right? Are they even communicating? Do they have the right structure for making decisions together as a family, not only today where they're at, but also looking into the future? Is the structure set up for true long-term success of making decisions together? Are they actively promoting this idea of family cohesion, of making sure everybody's on the same page, everybody understands the vision for where the family is headed, and everyone understands their roles and responsibilities in that journey. If I could get Io and Io support my please, that would be great. I'm getting some feedback. Perfect. That's better. <laughs> okay. So, oh, are you both oh, muted? Okay. Must be on my end. Feedback. Okay. So, and from there, beyond family cohesion, we're really thinking about the next generation, right? This idea of successors, which I know is a big theme for this conference. How do we prepare them to be responsible wealth stewards, however a family might define that? How do we prepare them to truly be leaders within the family? And the whole point of all of this is to increase the odds of success through generations, right? How do we study 100-year families? You may have heard that phrase before. How do we study 100-year families who've done this right, who got it right, and say, how do we bring those learnings and insights to our clients and adapt them to make them relevant? Next slide, please. So how do we do this? This is the process. The very first stage starts with what I call discovery. And in our business, traditionally, discovery is used to reference the ability to learn about the client, right? I want to learn what's important to the client, the facts and figures about the client. And in this case, I'm using the word discovery 
to a deeper extent. Many times I'm actually guiding families through their own journey of self-discovery because I'm trying to lead them to step two, which is so that they can articulate what is their vision for multi-generational success. Where do they want to be headed and what does that look like? In the context of the business, in the context of all of the family members, in the context of the wealth, what does a successful multi-generational vision look like for them? If we know where we're headed, we can then map out that customized action plan. And here is a whole breadth of opportunities. For some families, it's just setting up some conversations to get the com to get it started, get the process started. And for other families, it's much more involved. We might be establishing formal family governance structures and formal family documents like a family constitution, for example. So there's really a, a wide opportunity for engagement across all generations within the family constantly working towards making progress on achieving this vision for success and making sure that we're assessing along the way. Next slide, please. Yes. And when it comes when it to comes governance, to this is this idea of yeah. what are the structures that we need as a family to make decisions together. We work across a wide spectrum here. For some families on the left side of this slide, I, they they're, they're not very complex. Maybe they're only one or two generations in, they still have the family business, or they have mostly liquid wealth. It's fairly easy for them to begin making decisions together. But all the way over on the right-hand side of the slide, for other families, it's much more complex. We work with um, several fifth, sixth, or seventh generation business-owning families. It's not a mistake that they've been able to continue to have success. In fact, their success is coming upon a complex governance structure that we help them support and create over time. So that's on the right hand side. Of the slide. Next slide, please. And for those complex for those families, we're coming to the table to really help them build a robust governance robust. system from crafting a family mission statement, establishing a family assembly and a family and ultimately drafting and writing a family constitution that's inclusive, that all family members are on the same page about, and that they can use that as their guiding document, if you will, to support this multi-generational vision that the family has. Next slide. Discovery. This is where we start with clients, and it's my job as Jorge and I don't know to ask questions of clients that they usually don't have answers at the ready for. If I can do that, if I can ask them something that requires a little bit of soul searching, I've probably done my job, right? Okay, so I'll draw your attention to the very top left um, bubble of the slide when thinking about success. So I'll ask clients often, when you think about long-term success for your children, for example, what comes to mind? And they usually have a story, right? So for my son, this is where he is on his track and his career and his family, and this is where I think he's headed. And for my daughter, this is what her future looks like. So they have a pretty good sense of what success looks like for their kids. But what many families have not clarified that goes a level deeper is that second question in the top left bubble. What role do you want the family wealth and the family resources to play in their success? And not only in the success of your children, but if you're designing structures and trust entities, what role do you want family wealth to play in the success of the great great grandchildren you'll never meet? That is a very different soul searching question that has to be in alignment with the right family culture to support those desires, right? So this discovery process is truly about getting clients to articulate this vision for success at a deeper level than just superficial elements. Next slide, please. And through discovery, we attempt to identify some near-term goals that the family wants to work on. This is an example of a business owning family um, through the discovery process that I led with them. 
the client, he was a third generation business owner. His grandfather had started the business. He's married. He has two kids. The two children were too young yet to be in the business and dad got an offer to sell. Um, he knew financially, logically that selling the business at this point in time made sense for them given kind of what they needed to do to scale, to get to the next level. This new company really had the ability to do that. Uh, but dad was really struggling with the non-financial implications of the business sale. The family business was such an um, integral part of his identity growing up. This idea that he knew at some point he was going to work um, for the family company. And now that he's selling, he's wondering, am I taking something away from my children? because they won't have the opportunity to go into the family business like I did. Maybe I really need to rethink, this is the middle goal on the page, what is going to be the purpose of the wealth that we've now generated, the liquid wealth that's gonna come from selling the, selling the business? And how do I think about our family values and bringing my kids to the same page today? Oh, and by the way, my children are very inexperienced and now there's going to be tens of millions of dollars in the bank. How do I make sure that they're prepared to be financially responsible? Can you help us with that? Of course, absolutely we can. And lastly, now that there's been this transition into liquid wealth, how do we think more intentionally about philanthropy? And how do we carry out our family's philanthropic plan? Right? So these goals are born out of the vision and the discovery process that we lead directly with clients. Next slide, please. This idea of next gen education, just it's so prevalent. Um, Jorge and Io will, will tell you it comes up in nearly every conversation we have with clients, which is how do we make sure that the next generation is prepared? And on this page is a list of topics where we have developed proprietary curriculum that we share with clients and professionals that are in our network that they can use with their clients to ultimately build a customized curriculum that is going to make a difference. Next slide, please. An example of how this curriculum is used, I'm working with one third generation and business owning family today actually so um generation one and two are actually still living the second generation has formally taken over most of the active roles in managing the business it's three siblings um amongst them they have uh let's see i think they have 13 great 13 children so the third generation is made up of 13 kids and i am working with this family to run virtual education for the third generation over Zoom because we've been in COVID. So um, we get the cousins together, we call it Cousins Camp, and we do a customized yeah. curriculum for this family. Um, the most recent exercise we did was we taught a module on stocks and then I designed a stock picking exercise for the kids, they're all age 11 to 17 or 18. And they got to do this active participatory stock picking exercise together. They're building cohesion as cousins and they're also gaining experience and knowledge and education along the way. So that is an example of truly how we customize um, our approach to really next gen and rising gen education. Next slide, please. Lastly, the whole point of all of this is to put together a roadmap for our clients and to say, OK, based on the goals that you've articulated that are born out of the discovery process, what are the series of actions and conversations that you need to take together and that we will be there to support you in this process? What does the next year, two or three years look like so that we have a sense for what are the steps along the way? Take progress towards this idea of family cohesion, strong family culture, and good communications practices. And lastly, the very last slide, just kind of pulling it all together, we really think of family engagement as this truly holistic way to reach almost every aspect of our clients' sort of 
family wealth journeys, sure. if you will, right. right? From discovery and facilitation and facilitation. education and using interactive exercises, exercise. thinking about family philanthropy. Perfect. How do we bring that financial planning and wealth planning to the table and make sure that we can explain it in a way that everybody's on the same page, right? This is just incredibly rewarding. And it's just so critically important. When our clients have a certain level of success, they have access to the best investment, tax, and legal, legal advice. advice. But where they're often still seeking help is in this idea of marrying wealth with family, family challenges, family dynamics, succession planning, and the like. And that's where me and my team come to the table to support, provide additional support for success along the way. Slide Thank you very now. much. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, that was that was fantastic. Um, you know, and um, you know, I think that you know, ha g given all you've said, you know, I think it's 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 also very important for us to bring it to life. You know, as Orhe and I, you know, out there in the field, speaking to international families, African families, you know, there are common themes that um, you know we continuously run into, um, particularly around the subject of family engagement. And you know what we've basically done here is we've put together a, a set of questions that I, I think would, would, you know, would be very nice to bring to life, particularly for the audience, some of whom have actually thrown these, uh, these questions to us. Um, and and with that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and throw throw some of these questions, um, and hopefully, you know, we you know we're able to add a, uh, a level of, of of good value. Um, so in Africa, you know, as as you know, Ori and I we talk we talk about and Heather we we talked about, you know, track record in wealth succession planning hasn't really been been you know been been, been optimal you know um, however thanks to the likes of of african family firms and other types of organizations that are bringing this to you know to, to the bear you know the narrative is 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 is, is gradually changing when would you say is the best time for families to actually start this conversation just in light of the fact that you know wealth is really beginning to think you know in a planning framework yeah, do you want to take the slides down io or do you want sure. to leave them up? yeah so this is a this is a really important question, right? We we get this question all the time, like when do you start planning? When do you start talking about succession planning? Um, and there's an expression that you know, people in my field use often, particularly those consulting with families, and we say um, it's never too late, but earlier is better. <laughs> Right. So the earlier that you could really begin to initiate the dialogue with the people that are important to you, whoever that is, whether it's your children, your pro the professionals that are advising you, other family members, maybe it's siblings. Um, I don't think it's ever too early. I do think it's important to think about sort of how much to share in those conversations, particularly with kids, right, Ayo and Jorge? So frequently clients will get started in kind of sharing their vision, talking about family culture, talking about their family values, maybe without fully revealing the family balance sheet. And I think that that's okay, right? But it's this idea of getting that conversation started and um, beginning to share and open those communications practices are just so important. That will be, you're sort of laying the groundwork or the infrastructure, if you will. If you think about, I'm thinking about sort of telecom networking. You've got to lay the infrastructure, right? Having those conversations so that those lines of communications, when you have to talk about bigger, more important, maybe harder topics, that that network is already there. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Um, you and know, a, I think you were going to ask me to build on that maybe with a success story. Success story, precisely. That was yeah. going to be my next question. Yep. So there's a ton of success stories. In fact, the, the, the family I was just describing is a great one, right? They're so proactive. Mom and dad are still alive, and the second generation is really formalizing governance, you know, outside of sort of in, in let's see, to complement the family business structure, right? Making sure that they're getting in a assembly and a council and all of the family members on the same page and they're gung-ho about the third generation already. Um, that's a good example. But what comes to mind actually is the opposite of success stories, right? I go, what comes to mind is the clients who haven't done it well and it hasn't gone well. So I get calls regularly from 
professionals in our network and through advisors like yourselves, Jorge and Io, and they say, I have a client who hasn't done anything. I'm thinking of <laughs> one client right now who I I met, by the way, for the first time maybe three years ago. We still haven't made much progress, Io. But you know, his professional advisors, he's in his late 70s. And he owns, I don't know, countless businesses. He owns restaurants, casinos, hotels, transportation, all himself. He owns it all himself. His son isn't even, you know, he has a son and a daughter. His son is not involved in the business day to day at all yet, right? But in his mind, his son is magically just going to take it all over someday. But he is not prepared. Let me tell you this. His son runs like a very small transportation company that buses people back and forth to his casinos or something, right? His son doesn't run a nearly billion dollar empire of a collection of businesses, right? And so I think of this client who I met him three years ago. That was following a very bad car accident, I know. Oh, wow. This client had a car accident and by all accounts, it is a miracle that he literally walked away. He didn't even end up in the hospital with any significant complications from this accident. But even that, that was the, that was sort of the catalyst to get him to begin to start talking about it. Mm -hmm. But there is a ton at risk. Absolutely. He has nearly a billion dollars worth of assets with no plan for what will happen when he passes on or retires or whatever. But he just wants to move on to the next stage. He says he'll never retire. He, this guy probably won't. He's going to work until his last day, Io. We know those types of clients. Absolutely. But he needs to get his plan together. And so we have worked with him over the last year to really think intentionally about what is the plan to prepare your son. First of all, making sure the son even wants to do this. Also talking to his daughter about it so that she understands what the plan is and so that everybody's ultimately on the same page. And there's other clients. I got another call. Actually, this is another billion dollar client who's also done nothing, nothing. Not only that, apparently the children don't even know how much wealth the family has, right? So there's just so many examples of, of poor transitions where that communication and planning didn't happen. And then and then the, the worst case is then matriarch or patriarch passes away and it's a yep. scramble. And we have yep. all worked with those clients where it has just been a massive stress, right? Absolutely. Such stress to figure out what to do, how to do it. What would dad have wanted? What would mom have wanted? How do I carry, carry forth their legacy with integrity when I don't even know because we never had a chance to talk about it as a family? And I feel incredibly ill-prepared as a leader in this family to do it. How do I know which roles me and my siblings should take, right, without mom or dad's guidance, without them being around so yeah. hopefully that that brings that, the light. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. You, that, you know, you actually covered my next the next question that you know we get a lot. Um, you know, a lot of concern around, you know, a, a lot of limitations in 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 succession planning and wealth planning can be attributed, you know, in Africa and also in other parts of the world to the notion that you know patriarchs and matriarchs really fail to embrace the idea that they're going to die someday, right? And you know, I think you've spoken you've spoken a lot to to that in your previous set of comments. Um, you know, it's something that we continuously um, encounter and, you know, it can make the job um, interesting <laughs> in, in, in many ways and the other sometimes when we, when we, when we fall into these situations. But um, you, you've already talked about how successful next-gen preparation, um, where family leaders have embraced the idea of mortality, you know, without doing that can create problems. Maybe um, can you touch on a, a, maybe an example where it actually has been productive, you know, where, you know, the family member, the, the patriarch or the matriarch have embraced the idea that they're going to, um, you know, die someday, you know, you know, not trying to be, you know, um, you know, dark or anything, but they've, they've embraced the idea they're going to die someday and they've actually put the proper structures in place and it's ultimately led to some success. 
can you comment you know yeah there's countless examples of clients we work with where that's the case and i think that um look i think thinking about <clears throat> our own mortality and the mortality of our loved ones is, is hard right um and particularly given different cultural contexts around this idea of death and how to talk about death. I think if you're, if a family is having difficulty with that concept, I.O., rather than have it thinking about the death of the loved one, I like to shift the perspective and begin to get families to think about the legacy of their loved one while they're still living, right? So in other words, it's less about the loss and it's more about the impact and part and what is linked to the impact and the legacy is setting up future generations for success to carry out that legacy so it's basically taking the same topic and flipping it on its head and saying okay i'm not going to think about sort of the the blocking and tackling and tackling you know sort of tactics if you will after i'm gone but I'm going to think about what is my legacy and what is my hope for my loved ones in the future. And now I'm beginning to think longer term and therefore I can bring in this idea of setting up the next generation for success to carry out that legacy. It's a little bit softer, it's the same thing, right? It's the same thing, but it's maybe less focused on the business. It maybe is less focused on the structure and the tax and the legal and beginning that conversation instead with the softer family stories, family legacy, family history, principles for um, success. Actually, so this client, the one I mentioned, who was just having a hard time planning, I said to him, uh, his name is Rick, I said, Rick, put on paper for, for not only for, for, for your kids, but for your grandkids, like what are your guiding principles? for what you've built and what you've created, right? No, he's never done that before. Now suddenly he's thinking historically, he's thinking prospectively, he's getting that process by putting something on paper. So I think that that can be incredibly helpful is to think about your legacy and therefore what is the planning that it needs to be put in place to carry forth that legacy. Um, but countless success stories, Io, um, of families doing it right. I actually just had a family meeting last week with a family that heretofore hasn't had a lot of family conversations around the topic. Um, they, you might, this might resonate with both of you, with some of your clients. But this family, you know, the patriarch, if you will, um, describes himself as, you know, being beyond poor growing up. But Heather. When they use the phrase dirt poor, they're talking about me. They're talking about my family because we were so poor, we didn't have a floor in our house, right? We just had a dirt floor in our home growing up. And now I've had all of this tremendous financial success, which I'm so grateful for, but I don't know how to talk about it with my kids. He has three daughters. And, and frankly, we, we live a fairly conservative life and we always have so when I even try to bring up this topic with my daughters, they're like, yeah, dad, we got it. <laughs> they're not comfortable talking about it either because even his adult children have never really been involved in this idea of family wealth and management of the family wealth. And so success is, for example, him and his wife after several conversations with me and utilizing some discovery exercises together, feeling comfortable to hold that first family meeting. And we just did it last week at IO. Nice. The daughters were all like, this was great. Like they all felt so good because as I said, we're laying that infrastructure for those future conversations. And we just talked about one seemingly maybe less significant topic together, but we got it started. And with someone like me as a facilitator there to keep that conversation going, so that awkwardness and uncomfortableness about talking about it, right? That can also be a really big value add for clients is bringing in an outsider who's skilled to do this, who knows what you want to accomplish and can keep the family on track. That can actually make a big difference. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for that. That's actually very, very insightful. Um, you know, my next question is, is you know one that um, you know was very interesting and you know came up came up a few times and I know we we, we sort of touched on it a little bit um, is managing this family dynamic um, 
including but not limited to the ideas of a divorce, um, you know, multiple marriages, blended families, and in, in, in many cases in Africa, polygamy, and some of the challenges that you know these um, you know these these present you know when succession planning. Are there specific strategies that you know families or family-owned businesses could adopt um, to address some of these limitations as they consider a succession planning uh, strategies? Sorry, before you um, chime in, Heather, we've just got five minutes left because of the handovers for the next session. I just wanted to, to let you know. Sure, thank you. Yeah, look, I, I think it goes back to the theme of the day, which is that the, the foundation for engaging across families is what? I think I've said this a bunch of times today. It's communication, 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 right? So the more... The, 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 the bigger the family, right? Whether that's through multiple marriages, um, sometimes second marriages, sometimes blended families, kids from different marriages, it has to be about communicating and communicating the plan, right? And also having buy-in from everybody and really thinking critically about roles and responsibilities. So one of the things that I spend time with business owning families thinking about, for example, IO is, the difference between being an operator in the business and being a shareholder and an owner. Those both have responsibilities, but they're different, right? So just because you're not necessarily operating or working in the business day to day, because only one or two or three kids can do that, right? And the family is much bigger, doesn't mean that you're still not a part of it. You're still not a part of something. That goes back to the family having the right culture that supports um, sort of this concept of ownership and stewardship at a bigger level beyond just the management of the company. Does that make sense? Yeah. And therefore, that can create additional opportunities for inclusion and saying, okay, I don't need to be managing the business day to day, yet I can still feel a part of this entity, this vision. I can be a part of the family wealth journey, even though one of my brothers is going to run it, right? It doesn't mean that I'm not included. And so I think communication and inclusion are incredibly important. Thank you. Awesome. Um, just given the, you know, the time limitation we have, um, I know I had one or two more questions, but I think we'll, I'll probably like to use this as an opportunity to round up. Um, you know, we certainly have spoken about quite a number of different things here. And I think, you know, I, I, I personally find it very useful every time I hear you speak, Heather, about, you know, ways in which family engagement is really positioning families for success. I hope everybody that has ten, attended this session found it very useful. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out. Um, if you have any more more specific questions, um, you know, we'd be happy to, to, to address accordingly. And um, with that, um, thank you very much uh, to African Family Firms, CC, Nike, and the rest of the organizing team on behalf of um, Heather, Orhi, and myself. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and we'll certainly be in touch. Thank you so much.